Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. It's uh, February 19th, 2021. Hope your week has been a good one and uh, that you've been able to stay warm and comfortable and uh, hopefully that uh, you have power right now, depending on where you are in the country, of course, uh, or in the world, actually. Uh, of course, we've seen a lot of stuff out of Texas this week about the uh, problems statewide with uh, the utilities down there that uh, did not hold up well under a blizzard condition that hit. And uh, the state's been under severe power outages, rolling blackouts, uh, boiling water orders for uh, drinking water and shortages of pretty much everything under the sun. And that has affected the uh, distilleries as well. I want to bring in Robert Leckerish, our pal from Iron Root Republic Distilling. Robert, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Mark. Considering the crazy week we've had, I've been uh, again. It's been I've had a better week than uh, than some people here in the state, but uh, it's been pretty harrowing uh, for most of the, most of the last few days. Tell us what happened at your distillery just north of Dallas, and what you and your brother and your mom have been dealing with. Your mom is the uh, reigning distillery of manager of the year now in uh, the Icons of Whiskey America Awards, but. Uh, Tell us what uh, your family has been dealing with the last few days. Uh, I think when we moved to Texas, we knew there'd be snow every once in a while, but uh, this was not at all something that we were prepared for. Um, I think uh, obviously the state's electrical grid was not prepared for an occurrence like this. So it's been, um, we've been, again, trying to dig out first and foremost. Again, we had uh, over uh, a little over eight inches of snow at the distillery. Um, which is uh, pretty pretty crazy for us. Um, we've been uh, again, obviously, most of the week we are we didn't have power, so we, between the rolling blackouts that were scheduled and just power outages going down, the distillery uh, and my brother's uh, home actually were completely out uh, of power. Um, so most of the week, my brother um, gathered up his family and he came and spent it down at my house. Uh, I live a little bit farther south than they do and was a little bit more lucky with our electrical uh, situation. So we were able as a family to stay warm, kind of hunker down and kind of cross our fingers that nothing too terrible was having at the distillery. You got in there yesterday. What did you find? Uh, so we found uh, the barrel room has a lot of garage doors on it. So there's little gaps on the garage door. The garage door comes down. So we had a bunch of snow that had blown into the, uh, into the barrel room. So, we had little tiny snow drifts on the inside, which was pretty crazy to see. Again, I wish I had gotten some pictures of it. Uh, but the uh, temperature we had, we do have an insulated barrel our house, so we managed to maintain. Um, we were right around forty-five degrees, uh, which, which is cold as it got. So thank goodness, because outside it was obviously zero and below zero for for several days, and the fact that we didn't have the sprinkler system in the barrel warehouse freeze and break on us. That was our biggest concern. And so we managed to kind of luck out of that one and not, not run into that issue. And you guys aren't the only ones that have had problems like this. It's been really all over the state. Uh, I saw Heather Green from Milam and Green joking today that uh, they were boiling snow to try to get yeah. drinking water, let alone production water for the distillery. Uh, Marlene's been going crazy down there trying to get keep the distillery going and everything. But what have you heard from your colleagues or have you had a chance to talk to anybody yet? Uh, I have. We actually, um, uh, we were supposed to have a meeting of the Texas Whiskey Association on, on Thursday morning that we ended up canceling just because half the people had power, half didn't. Um, again, most people are, are, are water boilers, as you mentioned, uh, still are. Um, after talking with uh, as many people as I could, and as Daniel Whittington also reached out to most of the distilleries in the state, and everybody seems to have weathered this pretty well. Um, again, people are just starting to really to get back in. But from what everyone could tell, we didn't have any any tanks with alcohol bursting or any issues like that. Um, and again, we as a state, we're a pretty tight knit group. So we do reach out to each other to check on and make sure. And um, even I know locally in Austin, they were calling each other almost every day saying, hey, this is where do we have power? Because different part, different days, different parts of the city would have power. And so I know 
I mean, it was it was pretty crazy even just getting hold of some people because they were having to charge their uh, their phones in their cars, and that's the only way they had any cell service whatsoever. So we, as an as a as a industry in Texas, really lucked out with not having any major issues. You had a batch in the fermenters, though, when you had to shut everything down. That's been sitting there all week long. Uh, how long do you normally ferment for, and what do you think you're going to you're going to find when you get back in there early next week? Uh, our normal fermentations five to seven days, which is a little bit lo- I mean, it's a, tip- a little bit longer than typical. Uh, but I think we're going to find that it's going to be settled out quite a bit, so it's going to take quite a bit to kind of stir that that those fermenters up to so we can pump them out. Uh, we did check on the pH and everything on them when we were there yesterday, and they, everything was kind of in order. So it should be interesting to see kind of what type of ester profile we get off of this batch. I imagine it'll be quite a bit different than some of our standard, but again, so that could be really exciting too. So we might end up, uh, if we like it enough, who knows, we might end having a set that goes two weeks from now on that we keep rolling. So you never know. There's no chance of it freezing up though, right? The temperature doesn't get cold enough in there for the mash to actually freeze, right? No, the the uh, the main room uh, maintained again about forty eight degrees, so we didn't have any concerns that it was it was going to freeze. I mean, the mash at that point was already at twelve percent alcohol, so for it to freeze, it would have had it gotten pretty darn cold in that room, um, which we didn't quite hit that low of temperature. But um, but otherwise, yeah, that would be definitely a concern. I think if we luckily Jonathan had turned off all the water that we normally use for cooling on the fermenters. That would have been more of the issue of that freezing and then busting out the seams on the, uh, on the, on the jackets. Will there be any issues that you have to watch for in startup in terms of uh, getting natural gas back to the boiler to uh, start heating up water again, making sure all the utilities are solid and uh, that you actually have running water to the place that you don't have to boil. That's water is going to be the, the, biggest concern that we have is what's in the lines, how do we make sure we've drained and and make sure we're testing the water. That's our number one major concern that we're going to be dealing with. So we will probably have to run out quite a bit of water just to clear all the lines to make sure we didn't have anything sitting in there for too long with some of the untreated water or um, that, again, that we were under boil order for a few days under. So that's that's going to be the main concern. The natural gas, obviously, you can get pockets of gas in your gas lines, so you need to make sure that you're, you're running pretty smooth before we um, try to try to do a run through the boiler. So we'll probably run the boiler for about a day before we, um, before we get it. And uh, we're getting some folks that are talking about uh, special blackout releases <laughs> or the, uh, the Iron Root Snowmageddon release <laughs> or the... Uh, Tabitha suggested the iron root rolling blackouts or something there like those. Uh, for <laughs> something, you could do something interesting there. Yeah, grab some snow and uh, and uh, purify the water and use that to water down uh, some whiskey for a batch. I don't know. Something crazy. Who knows? Jonathan's always up to something in his mind. I never – I show up at the distillery some days. I'm like, what in the world were you doing this weekend that you came up with that idea? But – I uh, imagine this, especially with the, if it has a cool ester profile, we will probably set these barrels aside to do something really fun. And uh, Chris Ratcliffe is asking, what happens when you suddenly lose power at the distillery or you lose gas uh, for heating things up? You didn't have any warning that this was coming, right? No, we didn't have, well, we, we knew that the snow was coming in. And fortunately we had scheduled, um, we we had initially scheduled one day to, to make sure that we were sorted out. So we didn't start anything up on Monday. This started rolling in on Sunday night. So we'd already decided we weren't going to open on Monday and, and run on Monday. So we didn't have to worry about that. But if you're in the middle of a run, uh, the, some of the most major concerns that you have are that to lose power to your cooling system. Uh, Cause if your water, you're not cooling that water, then your condensers will overheat and you're going to start expelling gas or alcohol vapor into the, into the distillery. So with that, it's always, it's emergency shutdown on the boiler. And then you're going to be just running that condenser and again, trying to expose it. For us, our emergency reaction is we actually can drain part of our cold liquor tank and add new fresh water into it so that we make sure that we always have cold water running into the, uh, uh, into the condenser. Now, do you have the computers on uh, battery backups or whatever to give you some time to shut things down in the control systems? 
Well, that we, we're, we're very manual distillery, Mark, so we don't have any. That ha is something that we monitor directly. Just uh, Jonathan okay. or I are always in that room monitoring one the chilling, the chiller, monitoring its power, the gas. Uh, again, if the steam stops flowing or there's an issue with the boiler, we can pick up on that pretty quickly just from being in the distillery for a number of years now. You kind of you have your expected sounds, and when you don't have those sounds, you know something's wrong almost immediately. Um, so we're not on uh, computerized. We do have um, like emergency, like a, if uh, like alcohol detectors or CO2 detectors and stuff within the distillery. But as far as that, we're always watching the actual physical thermometers on the still to tell us where we're at on the different different parts of the run. And Graham Frazier is asking from the UK, what's the normal temperature in Texas this time of the year? Well, that can vary depending on what part of Texas you're in. If you're all the way down along the uh, Gulf Coast, it can still be in the 70s at times, but not this time of the year, right? Or not this week, at least. No, what do you no, normally get this time of year? Normally, this time of year, we're going to be probably in the in the 50, 50s to 60s is pretty pretty typical for us. Um, again, at night, dipping down into the 40s up until kind of we get to, to March, we'll start warming up after that. Um, I mean, down south and as you mentioned, Mark and Corpus or Houston right now, you're talking seventies could be, could be fairly normal. Uh, I know I saw the weather in Cancun was, was 80 degrees this, this week. So, um, Oh, we don't want to bring that up now, do we? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, what you can do? Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, well, we uh, can start. I don't want to go. I don't want to start <laughs> trouble, yeah, but, no, uh, no, no. and seventies as Tabitha asks, What's that in proper measurement <laughs> in the UK Celsius? Oh, that would goodness. be about a little over 20, 21, 22 degrees, right. something like that. 20 degrees is 68 Fahrenheit. So I remember that from my darkroom days with processing chemicals. So 20 <laughs> degrees would be 68. So oh, 70 would be something like 22, 23 degrees. So, right. and so Robert, I want to thank us, you for joining us. A uh, bit lower. Go ahead. So oh, no, thank so you for joining yeah, us. For us stay quiet. safe, guys. Tell your brother we said hello and your mom, Marsha. And uh, stay safe and keep us posted on how things go when you get back in next week. we Will do, Mark. And I, I can say that uh, I think my dog likes the snow as much as yours does, but I don't think she's going to see it. Oh, yeah. Often, so. <laughs> yeah, I got to admit, Bader's been a good boy out in the snow the last few weeks. He, uh, he loves the snow. But thanks again, Robert. Take care and stay warm, okay? All right. Will do. Cheers, Mark. Okay, you too. That's Robert Leckerish from Iron Root Republic Distilling in Denison, Texas, joining us with an update. Now let's bring in our guest for the rest of the hour or so, Stephanie McLeod from Doers. How are you, Stephanie? I'm I'm very well. I I can't believe the weather in, in Texas. I was watching it this morning on the news, and it was like minus 19 uh, Celsius. Um, so really incredible crazy we had yeah, snow last year uh, last week um but you know, nothing in comparison to that <laughs> and you're used uh, to it i mean there are parts of texas that i think when we lived down there in the mid 80s or late 80s for about five years in houston i think we saw snow maybe two or three times in five years and december january february yeah. would be, still be in the 60s you could go out and play golf in that weather easily. So, uh, and as Matt yeah. points out, Iron Root started off Tuesday colder than Alaska. That is just not right. Well, it depends on what part of Alaska you're That's in as right. well. So <laughs> what I am sipping here is your newest whiskey, uh, Portuguese Smooth, the uh, eight-year-old that's uh, done in port barrels. Tell yeah. us a little bit about this one, because uh, I have to acknowledge that I've gone through a lot of this bottle. This is dangerously drinkable in my opinion. I, I have, I <laughs> yeah, posted so my tasting I. notes for it as soon as it was officially <laughs> announced. And I, uh, I got to admit, I like this one and I would like it even if doers wasn't a sponsor. That's how much I like this whiskey. <laughs> Do you know, it really, it does go down easy, doesn't it? It's, um, it's just, you know, it, it's got all the signature notes of Dura. So it's got, it's got the honey, it's got the vanilla, it's got the citrus notes. But it's just bursting with with red fruit. So there's there's strawberries in there. There's you know cherry, a bit of cherry coming through. Apricots, um, even milk chocolate. Uh, I was I was getting tonight as well. Um, 
every time you go back to it, there's just something a little bit different that you never you never noticed before. Um, so this is the third in our in our smooth series. Um, you know, if you don't know the brand, um, age statements and and smoothness are you know what we're all about. And so this series was really about celebrating smoothness through um, different types of cask finishes. So the first one was Caribbean Smooth, where we used rum casks. Um, the second one was our first for Scotch whiskey, um, finishing in Mescal casks, so Illegal Smooth. And then our Ruby Beauty um, Portuguese Smooth, which was finished in Ruby Port casks. And as ever, when we're developing um, these new products, we really keep a keen eye on how it's progressing. So sometimes every week we might sample. With Port, we're a little bit more sure of ourselves. Um, and we sample that every month. And it's really just at the point where you think it's just going to tip over, that's when you, you stop it and put it into an inert cask ready to be bottled. Tell me about the process for creating the first three. I know there's one more coming we can't really talk about yet later this mm -hmm. uh, year, but uh, <laughs> tell me about the process for selecting the casks for those first three. Um, <clears throat> it, well, it really came about with um, a meeting down in London where we, we just wanted to explore the different facets of jurors and and to do that through first of all our double aging where we take blend we put it back into to oak casks uh, for an additional period of maturation um but also to kind of celebrate the different cultures that we can encounter when we um use different types of casks so the first one was quite an easy one you know we're owned by bacardi you know, the biggest rum brand in the, in the on the planet. So we thought we really we need to we need to do something with rum. And so our colleagues in Puerto Rico, they were just recovering from Hurricane Maria, and they were in they were in a really bad way at that 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 point. But they sent us through the casks that they could um, for us to finish off the spirit wasn't quite enough for us to do the whole batch so we had to get in um other uh cast from other um caribbean rum distilleries but um but you know they really stepped up to the plate and gave us most of the cast that, that we needed so um and again we, we knew really what we were doing with rum and we just got these lovely banana and, and ripe fruit aromas with the rum um so it just kind of transports you into a you know, into a beach um, when you're drinking that whiskey. It feels if you're in a hammock um, somewhere exotic, which we can only dream of at the moment. And then the second one, Illegal. Um, we had been toying with the idea for a long time um, using mescal casks. And I tried different types of mescal and none of them really seemed to seem to blend with the whiskey. There didn't seem to be any sort of interaction. And then we came across Illegal, and it's just such a fresh mezcal. Um, lovely citrus notes, lovely green um, sliced pepper notes coming through. And it really went well with our whiskey. And as soon as the Scotch Whiskey Association relaxed the the regulations on the types of casks that we could use, uh, which then included Mescal, um, we hit the green button and um, and we just went for it. And so, I mean, it was a really nerve-wracking process because we'd never used Mescal before. And um, so we sampled it every week. <laughs> Just to, and as you to point out, that sure really that required okay. a regulatory change. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, as you pointed out, that really required a regulatory change to even make it legal, right? Yeah, I mean, it. You know, it 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 just happened. You know, it's just so fortuitous. We were, you know, we had everything set up with illegal, and the thing that was that was holding us back was 
that prior to the law changing, we would have had to have called it a, a spirit drink. And you know, we just thought that was such a shame that we, that we would do that. So as soon as we were allowed to call it a Scotch whiskey and, and finish it in these fabulous casks, then we went for it. And you know the illegal team, um, they were they were amazing. And this time last year, um, I think it was this time last year, we were in New York um, doing media launch <laughs> um, of illegal, and we were in packed bars and <laughs> meeting people and <laughs> seeing them in person. Uh, so. So it was it was good that we were able actually to do that prior to um, Armageddon striking and uh, yeah. So so that was really that was a really interesting one to do, a real first. And and then we decided to to focus on on Europe with the the Portuguese move. And. As Chris Ratcliffe pointed out uh, a few seconds ago, his comment was, this is $22. Is that right? Yeah, it's right. These are actually, <laughs> these are actually affordable whiskeys. And was that part of the deal was to try to keep the price point reasonable too? I know that's above your pay grade, but I know you've got to sort of keep that, that in mind, that's... right? Yeah. Um <clears throat> You know, my my remit is is firmly on the quality of spirit, um, and that you know the price point is is the other chaps in the in the business. Um, but you know, we, we just make the, the best whiskey that we can, and you know that does require us buying good quality casks, um, because the better the cask, the better the whiskey, and that is. Um, a rule that that we have to um, go with with whiskey, and and these were cracking casks. But whenever we get in, um, well, any casks really, um, we always nose the casks prior to filling them. And so sometimes it's a lovely sunny day when we're out filling the casks, and sometimes it's freezing cold and windy and wet. Um, but no matter what the weather, um, we're out there nosing these casks. And if there are any casks that, you know, have got an off note that, that we don't like the look of, we we put it to the side. Or sometimes, if we're just not quite sure about it, we'll still fill it, but we'll mark it and say, before we dump it, let's check it again on its own. Um, and And really, as long as we keep doing these things, um then it just makes this the whole process of exploring different casks much easier and much more fun. And you know, we it's really just a case of sampling and observing and, and noting down what we're finding and then using that experience on on the other finishes that are going to come along very soon. <laughs> We've got two um, in the pipeline at the moment. One of them so I know about, and that will be <laughs> an amazing one when it comes out for the price tag, if it's in that same price range, because uh, I know about other whiskeys that have been done in that kind of wood, and everybody seems to charge a markup for those whiskeys. So mm. we won't go anywhere... We won't go Don't near there. Don't say anymore. I'm not going to. I'm not going <laughs> to say anymore. But we have a good comment. I, lo I love this comment from Tabitha, Spirit <gasps> Bomb. I'd rather spend my money on a quality, freely available whiskey than chasing a limited edition, overpriced one. Yeah, I mean, why get a whiskey? I mean, you can spend all your time mm. searching for those dusty, rare, overpriced ones. But uh, if you find one you really like, just go for it. Yeah. Um, Watchman nine ninety nine. Aberfeld E12 yeah, is a great value absolutely. and delicious if that counts towards a doer's dram. And yes, it does, because you are responsible for those as well, for all of the single malts, right? Yeah. I've got an Aberfeldy here. Yeah, I mean, Aberfeldy was, was the only facility to be built by the, the Dewar's family. So Aberfeldy is is really important um, to, to Dewar's. Um, we have five distilleries. Um, so Aberfeldy 
and uh, Royal Brackla, which are the, and Macduff, which are the Highland malts. And then we've got two space sides, Kugeliki and Altmore. And, and all of those are released now. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're busy at Jewers. We're busy. But I have um, two people that have just joined my team. Um, and they are, um, you know, both blenders. And because we're so busy just now, so um, it, it's really great to have, you know, all this talent um, that's going to help us keep expanding and keep innovating and and just keeping Scotch whiskey relevant, um, not only now but in years to come. So laying down the the legacy. And let, I think Juan may have jumped in a little bit later with his question about uh, who provided the casks for the uh, the rum casks. And uh, we should note that Dewar's is owned by Bacardi, so it's pretty easy to figure out where the casks came from, uh, since Bacardi is the number one producer of Puerto Rican rum. Um, so we just want to explain that real quickly. But um, let's see here. I was going to... And Spirit Bomb, Tabitha, Aberfeldy 12 is such an underrated whiskey. I actually love it. And I would second that because yeah. I have always <laughs> touted Aberfeldy 12 as one of the perfect drams for somebody who is new to scotch because yeah. it doesn't have the smokiness. That's exactly what I tell people. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. what makes that dram um, so good? You know, it, it's... Well, you know... Um... You were talking at Robert was talking earlier about you know that that long fermentation and he's wondering what on earth it's going to taste like and I, I suspect it's going to be fruity <laughs> but yeah the, the the longer you so we have a long fermentation um at Aberfeldy it's not as long as five days I, I have to say um so we're about three just over three days um but we get all these really lovely um fruity notes coming through as well as as green grassy notes that come through um, in the in the new make spirit, um, and as I was saying earlier about you know choosing good casks, so we we um, mature it in a variety of different casks, bourbon casks, um, casks that have previously held Scotch whisky, sherry casks, and de char de char casks as well. So you know when we talk about uh, a single malt we are still blending because we're bringing together different cask types of that same spirit um, in order to get the, the profile that we're looking for. So, so vanilla and, and spice coming through, um, you know, from the, the sherry cask. So it's, so it's very important to have not only balance in a blend, but also balance in a, in a single malt as well. So always you mentioned hiring. You mentioned hiring two new blenders for your staff. Uh, how do you yeah. recruit a blender? It's I've never seen an ad in the paper for whiskey blender wanted. Um, how do you hire a blender? Well, yeah. Well, it was on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, well, one of them, um, so Keith Geddes, um, he worked with me before. And then he went off and did his own thing um, with another company for a while. And, you know, he saw that we were expanding and, you know, doing you know, really exciting things. And he wanted to, to come back and, and help us with that. So, so he's back with us. And we've got a girl called um, Rianne Ferguson. And I don't know, she might be watching. I'm not quite sure. Um, but so she joined us um, from another whiskey company and, you know, she's only she's 27 and she's just, she's great. And, you know, she just gives a different perspective on whiskey making. And the two of us were in um, one of the warehouses the other day and she said, oh, I just love being in a, a, a warehouse. It's just so peaceful. And it, and it really is. <laughs> just all these oak casks just slumbering gently, waiting um for their moment in the in the sun. And uh, so so it's really it's an exciting time because 
we've got so many projects and we don't always just want to react to a demand from the market. We want to be able to to try out new techniques, new different, you know, different types of casks, um, so that we're then able to to push forward um the ideas that, that we've come up with. Um so it's very much a kind of a two-way street between um us in operations and you know as a blending team and our brand team and also our, our whiskey drinkers as well because you know, we, we we try to listen to to what they are, are asking us for because if we're not producing what they're wanting then they're not gonna buy it. So um we really are you know listening hard um to to what they want. And you know we're just so thankful that you know during all this that that people are still enthusiastic about whiskey and it's you know it's it's you know, live streams like, like yours, Mark, that are just, that are keeping um, the message of whiskey and appreciating whiskey alive. And, and I'm sure people probably haven't learned so much about whiskey and, and other spirits as, as they have um, during this lockdown. I think people are just absorbing um, all this knowledge and people are becoming expert bartenders at home. Um, so you know, it's it's certainly it's not been a pleasant time, but there's I think there's there's many things that we've learned from this period of, of isolation. <laughs> How have you been working with your team when everybody's been working from home instead of uh, being able to get around a blending table? Well, two days a week we try to all be together. Um, so obviously, you know, two meter distance apart, face masks on. Um, we obviously can't wear face masks when we're assessing the whiskey. Um, so you have to kind of do it one at a time. Um, but it, it works to a certain extent. It, it's by no means perfect. And I'm just desperate for us all to just be back working normally. But you know, thank goodness for things like Teams and and Zoom, um, and you know, you, you can pretty much have a normal conversation. But not everyone's Wi-Fi is up to the job, and it's like you're on mute, and <laughs> some of these kids are playing up, and it's a dog barking, and you know, <laughs> uh, and I think we're all kind of now tuning out all these different sounds. We're just you know, we're all getting used to it now, but there's still always somebody at a meeting that's on mute when they're talking. <laughs> it's oh, just yeah. one of these things that we've just never got used to. <laughs> Had that happen a couple of times this uh, week. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so so we're we're working we're working as best we can. And you know that that's two products, three products that we've actually um started during lockdown. So not really stopped when will us. we see those uh, coming out? I know one of them is the one we talked about that we can't talk about, but uh, <laughs> but we'll see the other ones um, coming out at some point here fairly soon, I would imagine. Yeah, uh, the summer there should be two releases, and then okay. um, one probably the start of next year. All being okay. well. I have a question mm -hmm. from Chris Ratcliffe. Is there a particular <laughs> dram or distillery you look after and wonder why it isn't more acclaimed? Are there any distilleries in the portfolio that uh, you think deserve more attention than they get from the whiskey uh, community? Do you know, we, we've been quite, we're quite late to the party probably. Um, with releasing our single malts. Um, but, you know, although, you know, it might appear as if they're they're not being appreciated, they're actually growing. Um, I think they're the fastest growing um, single malts, especially Aberfeldy and especially in North America, 
than than other um, single malts, obviously from a different base. Um, it, that's fair to say, but you know the team in in North America have just been doing some outstanding things. Um, you know our, our brand ambassadors were just so lucky to have them, and they've been really spreading the words of of Aberfeldy, of Dewars, of you know all of our of all of our portfolio, and and you know things like activities like barrels and bees um, with Aberfeldy. Um, it's just been so exciting, you know, bringing in you know, um, you know, apiaries from from different cities that they happen to be in, and um, different cocktails, and you know, we've just been keeping the message alive that that Scotch whisky isn't about you know ceremony and you know, drinking it a certain way and pronouncing it correctly and you know paying lots and lots of money um for something really exclusive scottish whiskey was made to bring comfort for for friendship and to tell stories over and and that is something that we firmly keep in mind um when we're when we're making a scotch whiskey and when we're, we're talking about it as well because you know we're all about you know cocktails you know, we've got a cocktail for every new product that we bring out. Um, and, you know, we're going to be exploring that very soon. Um, exciting fact, doing a, a cocktail um, making night um, with a chef. Um, so a very renowned uh, Portuguese uh, chef. So, um so that's going to be exciting. I thought at first I was going to have to actually cook, um, but thankfully it's just a cocktail that I've got to make. So I think um, George Mendes's um, recipes will be safe um, out of my reach. And that is coming up next Saturday on the 27th, right? Yeah. People can yeah. find out more about Something that at the Doer's right. website. I know your colleague Gabe Cardarella from the brand team is also doing a session March 3rd with uh, Chef George Mendes as well with uh, yeah. Men's Journal Magazine. And we've got links for both of those on the uh, calendar at uh, whiskeycast.com to sign up for them. Um, yeah. We've got a question. And uh, Tabitha points out she he, she loves that you said that because she feels that sometimes uh, we geeks can get too, bit, too serious about our favorite spirit. And it is possible to take this too seriously, isn't it? You know, I, I, you know, people are really interested in Scotch whiskey, and there's there's a lot to be interested about because when you think about Scotch whiskey, especially a malt whiskey, you know, it's three ingredients: water, malty barley, and yeast. Um, we use roughly the same kit. You know, we mill, we we mash, we ferment, we distill. Um, but two distilleries. Sitting not too far away from each other, say Krigeliki and Altmore, um, produce completely different styles of spirit, and and that's incredible. If you were to do a, a blind tasting of a an Isla whiskey, a heavily peated Isla whiskey with a you know a light Roland whiskey, you'd almost think they were in different spirit categories. Never mind made in the same country, not that far away from each other. So, so Scotch whiskey is fascinating, and and there's so much to appreciate. And you know, anyone that says that they know everything about Scotch whiskey doesn't know everything about Scotch whiskey because literally every day is a school day. Um, you know, we'll open up casks and thinking that we know what we're going to find, and and we really we're always being surprised by a Scotch whiskey. So, you know, you've got every right to take it seriously and delve right into it because, because there is so much to learn. And, and mostly it's about comparing and contrasting different styles of whiskies. And that's the way that we build up our knowledge, our, our sensory knowledge of whiskey, is by trying different styles of whiskies and saying, you know, yeah, that, that's a bit more 
peaty or that's a bit more steel. Why is that? And then delving into, you know, the nuts and bolts of the distillery. And and most um, distilleries now are doing virtual tours. So our Dears Aberfeldy distillery, you can now do a, a virtual tour um, of a distillery because you obviously you can't come and visit us in person. And we've got our online shop as well. So, so you know, there, there's so much information um, that people can get really geeky about. And, you know, that's great. But there's people that couldn't care less um, whether, you know, it's a worm tub or a shell and shoot condenser. They just like their whiskey and they want to pour ginger ale into it and a block of ice and and that's it. And and that's the joy. That's the joy of whiskey. And that's why I think I've been in this industry for the you know, length of time that I have because you know I just I just love um that, that people appreciate it and and have such a connection to it. Um, you know, you hear about people wanting to be buried with a, a bottle of jewels and you know. Um so I don't think you get that with um any other type of food or you know, I don't know, maybe people do want to get buried with a can of coke, I don't know. But uh, you know, there, there's something about whiskey that that has this connection to people. Um and it, it's through generations that, that we have this connection and, and across the world. I don't think it's as much about taking it too seriously as maybe taking it with the humility to know that uh, no one really knows everything there is to know about Scotch whiskey or whiskey in general. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, and if you approach it with that humility yeah. that you don't know everything, then that's when you start learning. Yeah. We have a good comment here from exactly. Ben Barnack. I'd say Krigeliki is the highest rated of the Dewar's distilleries right now. Must be the warm tubs. And you mentioned warm tubs. Uh, that adds a little bit of meatiness into the uh, spirit from Krigeliki, right? Yes, it does. Um, yes, we, we refer to it as meatiness. So the, the new make spirit um, of Krigeliki is, is very robust. Um, so when you compare it to Altmore Distillery, it's very light and ethereal and perfumed. Um, but Krigeliki definitely has that real meaty character. But that meaty character is actually um, obscuring um, the, the fact that the new mixed spirit is actually packed full of esters. So really fruity esters. And so when we put it into our oak casks and it starts to mature, then these meaty notes start to recede and allows these fruity notes to come to the fore. And so actually, Krigeliki has probably got the highest level of, of esters of, of all of our distilleries. And that only becomes apparent after it's spent quite a while in, in oak casks and then these um you know the, the pineapple and, and ripe fruit aromas then really start to emerge in the whiskey and you know the first time that I tried Krigeliki in fact I was doing a kind of audit of, of all our, of our Krigeliki cast and I thought it was going crazy because I kept getting the smell of pineapple and you know, I thought there was something wrong with me, and then I passed it to somebody else and said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm getting pineapple." And it's a particular type of pineapple. It's like pineapple chunks in syrup, so it's really, really sweet. Um, but it's just a joy to find it. But then you get that little sort of hint of cordite um, at the back of it, so so it's fruity, but it's got this real backbone um, behind it, so it really stands up for itself. You can do anything with Krigeliki and you still know you're drinking a Scotch whiskey. <laughs> I'm not sure about the answer to this. And normally I generally know the answer to questions I'm asking for listeners, but I don't know this one. Ben Marnock wants to know if mm. you're in charge of the blending for William Lawson's as well. 
And if so, how does the selection of whiskeys for that differ from regular doers? And I'm not 100% sure if William Lawson's is part of the doers portfolio. And I hope I'm, I hope, hope I'm not crossing over it lines is. here, but is it? And Okay. I wasn't 100% yeah. sure because yeah, they don't yeah. sell it here in the States. So, <laughs> so you yeah, work on that I, one I as well. I don't know why right? that was. I, we did try it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So William Lawson's, it is very much Europe, Russia, and actually Mexico. Uh, so Latin America, um, it, it does very well. <clears throat> And it's a very, very easy drinking whiskey, uh, very fruity, very light. Um, so again, really easily mixed. So, so well done for that question. Someone's been doing their homework. <laughs> That's great. Whiskey Canuck in Ottawa wants to know, he imagines that the blender's job is mostly working to maintain the consistency of your ongoing expressions. But how much time do you get to work on new things or specials or new additions or new product development? How much of the, uh, what's the balance between core ranges and uh, experimenting? Well, I mean, you, you've got to do both. <laughs> so that, that's why um, we brought in more people um, because we definitely have to do both of those activities. So it's very important that we maintain the consistency of all of our blends and all of our malts. Um, but equally, it's very important that we that we develop. And, you know, a lot of my time is spent talking and, and planning and, you know, looking at different types of casks, um, as well as the really important job of, of nosing the whiskey, and ensuring that you know we're using the right selection of of malts and grains in the right types of casks. But in addition to this, we're also looking at what are we laying down for the future. So every year we receive a forecast from the markets, and that tells us, you know, what we're going to be selling in years to come. Um, and so we then have to work back and then lay down enough spirit, you make spirit, fill it into the right type of casks so that in five years time, 20 years time, 50 years time, um, you know, the, the Dewar's brand um, tastes and noses the way it does now. Um, so, so it's really important you know, to, to have that legacy and to ensure that <clears throat> the, the Dewar's house style lives on. Speaking of the uh, house style here, I am holding a little bit of the remaining sample of my double-double 21-year-old. And ah. when are we going to see another double-double expression coming? Hint, hint. Uh, we need more of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that's um, that's in the pipeline, as they say. Um, yes, you're very well briefed. <laughs> How much of this yeah, is marketing driven compared to the, the um, new, what you guys come up with on your team? Um, I would say it's 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 fifty fifty. Um, so the actual process that you know that we use for double double that was very much um you know operations and um and it, it's it's fun doing it that way um you know we want to hear what you know our insights guys are, are saying which informs the marketing strategy which we then we must respond to that we we can't we can't ignore the voice of the consumer. Um, so, you know, we have to try and, and make it work. And, you know, it, it's very difficult to be enthusiastic about something you don't believe in. And, you know, I, I do have to believe in something before, you know, I want to do it. 
And so we have many, many debates, and but we always we always reach a compromise. And you know, it it's it's my job really to to make things happen, to to create and basically a problem solver. So you know, if they need something in the market and they need it for a certain timeline, then you know, myself and my colleagues, we just have to find a way of making it happen. And and that is it, pure and simple. We don't want to let down any markets or any of our whiskey drinkers. Um, but the, the key thing is that it's always done um, with with quality in mind. Um, so, so we would never jeopardize that. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's very different. and all lenders in every whiskey company face the same challenges. And um, but we all love it, you know. It's it's, it's it really is the best fun, and um, and getting to to talk about it and work with whiskey every day, it, it is a privilege, and and one I try not to take for granted. Well, the old joke. Speaking of believing in something, I believe I'll have the rest of this since we're here. This twenty-one uh, wow. year old double double. Tell me about the process that went into making the double doubles, because we know you've and yours has been focused on double maturation for a long time, but you really took it two extra steps with the double doubles, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was set the challenge of, you know, what what could you do to make our whiskey even smoother? You know, what what can we do, and you know, I think my back was against the wall. And all these marketing chaps were, you know, right, come on. And, um, and, and actually, I kind of went back to the archives. So we've got an archivist, Jackie Sargent. And, and she basically, there's, there's nothing about your history that, that Jackie doesn't know. And she was always telling me about um, the first Master Blender, um, marrying the different um, whiskies by region. And so I thought, okay, so what if we, you know, brought the malts together, married those or double-aged those, brought the grains together and, and double-aged those, um, and then brought it together, double-aged it, and then finished off with some sort of finish. And that was kind of the the thoughts that were in my head. And then it kind of came up, well, this is like this is a fourth stage. So that's double two, so double double. That's really how that name came about. I think we first came up with quadruple aged, and we thought that was a bit of a mouthful. So <laughs> so it was double double. Um it really it gives such integration to the flavor profile um, because you know the the malts are coming together and really integrating with one another and the grains are doing the same thing. So sometimes when you're blending whiskey together, whiskies can be so different in character that it's almost like bringing oil and water together. Um, and so that double aging, period allows that integration to happen so that you know that we had those two strands we bring them together and then the blend double age uh, for for a month and then that's brought out and then 21 goes into oloroso the 27 into palo catardo and the 32 year old into pedro jimenez casks and and it just seemed you know, good to try and palcatarta we hadn't really used that much in the past. And so we thought, you know, this is new for us, so let's try this this different type of sherry. And and the kind of unnerving thing about Palo Cotardo is that it is much lighter in colour than the Oloroso and the uh, Pedro Jimenez. Um so it's like a kind of you know right in the middle but what I wanted to do with each of these I didn't want it to be a, a, 
a copy and paste of the 21-year-old recipe onto the 27, onto the 32. I wanted each one to have its own particular style and reflect a different aspect of the Dewar's House style. So the 21-year-old was that kind of elegant, fruity, toffee. The 27 was the citrus and the honey notes, which I thought would go really well with Paolo Cotardo. And then the 32-year-old was showing the, the smokier style and the heavier style of, of Dewar's, the bit you get right at the end. And I thought that would really go well with the kind of treacly unctuousness of of Pedro Jimenez. So so that that's really how it happened. Um and I really didn't know what to expect, but I was I could have almost wept with with gratitude when I when I realized that actually they were smoother and and just this you know, especially if you leave it in the glass for a little while and just let it kind of explore the atmosphere um, and it really pays dividends. And then when you add a little bit of water and again, it just kind of bursts open. Um, so as I say, you know, it, it is very much down to the whiskies themselves that were laid down 21 years ago, 27 years ago, 32 years ago, and, you know, lovingly nurtured. You know, the, the blender, it, it often appears to be a very solitary uh, role, but, you know, it's it's not, you know, we depend on people 20, 30 years ago putting the right spirit into the right cast and taking care of them. Um, and then now pulling out the casks and again catering for the spirit. So, so it's very much a, a team effort. And, you know, I, I could not do my job um, without that team behind me. There's just no way. Who were your mentors when you were starting out and you were part of the team? Who were you? Uh, who taught you and who inspired you? And who do you give credit to for your success now? Um, I think there's a, a, a few people um, along the way. So I started out in, in academia at the University of Strathclyde. And you know, I, was, I was very lucky to work for someone who had a real passion um, for, for the sensory analysis of, of Scotch whiskey. So that was uh, Dr. John Piggott. And, and he was um, one of the first people to actually um, a sign um, uh, a vocabulary to to Scotch whisky, and so you know he was very passionate about it, and and he very much opened my eyes to, to Scotch whisky. So he was he's definitely the person um, who put me on this path. Um, so so that was one person, um, and it varies. People along the way have encouraged me. Um, again, you know, in Bacardi, you know, Peter Little, um, he was in charge of all of our laboratories and he very much pushed me forward um, to do things that I didn't think I was able to do. Um, and, you know, the, the, the master blender who was in post um, when I started training, um, you know, he was a very different character. He he did give me um, lots of words of advice, but the business was different then. And, you know, we, we basically were making white label and, and Dewar's 12, doing a little bit of, of malt, but not very much. And the business is, is completely different from what it was. And, and so much of that I've just had to learn <laughs> as I go along, um, because there aren't really any textbooks particularly um, that tell you, you know, this is how long you should keep Aberfeldy in a sherry cask. Um, this is something that we are writing as we go along. And um, and also the, all the, the various brand teams that I deal with as well. Um, you know, you, you learn so much. 
um, just through talking to people and and also my colleagues in Scotch whisky as well in in other whisky companies because I think we're unique um, in the fact that at the distillery we all talk to each other. So Diageo, Pernod Ricard, ourselves, we come together and we discuss things that are non-competitive. Um, if our distillery are missing a, a vital part, another competitive distillery will probably help us. And I think Robert was talking about that earlier, about yeah. you know, the distilleries, you know, they're in the marketplace, fierce competitors, but you know, when we're actually making the whiskey, we, we do come together because in order to make our blends, we reciprocate with other companies. And so it's really in everyone's interest to ensure that we're all making the very best whiskey that we can. Um, so so it's, it's a variety of people that inspired me, but I'm mostly inspired really by the consumers and the whiskey drinkers that I meet when I'm out in market. Because when we launched um, Double Double, it was in uh, Chicago and um, it was at the, the Binnie's Whiskey Fair. And people were trying it the first time and it was really it was such an honour actually um, to see just the joy in people's faces because they just loved it. And, and it really, you know, because you don't really get to see that very much um, when you're you're working away in Scotland and your your brand is being released in another country, and uh, so that that was really it was wonderful to see, and that really does give me my inspiration that people appreciate this so much. I remember being in a in the airport in Singapore. And a man from the Philippines was standing talking to me about how much he loves Craigality to the extent that he nearly missed his flight. He suddenly looked at his watch, oh, I need to go. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's the kind of, you know, the things <laughs> that just make you think, wow, you know, this is this is why we need to produce the very best whiskey that we can, because you know, people out there, they do love what we do. I used to keep doing it and keep doing it well. You mentioned that when you started out, uh, it was just basically Dewar's White Label and the 12-year-old. Chris Ratcliffe wants to know about the process for creating the 15-year-old Dewar's that you put together. Uh, did you have a clean sheet of paper when you started out? Did you have a, a brief from marketing? How did it uh, come about? Yeah, well, it was it was a brief really from the, the Chinese and the Taiwanese, Taiwanese team. Um, and they wanted to create a 15 year old. So we, we'd already created a, a 15 year old blended malt and it wasn't doing that well. People didn't really get it. And so they said, right, we want to do a blended scotch this time. And so because this was really kind of my first assignment, I was really wanting to get this one right. Um, so I kind of drew on all my, my sensory training and I they told me the competitive brands that they were wanting to go after. And so I put out, you know, a whole host of samples and I got the marketing teams to, to nose the samples blind and then tell me the ones that they liked the best and why that was. And, and what that did was that it gave me uh, a map, a sensory map that, that I could then use in order to, to choose the whiskies I thought best fitted with what the market were looking for. And I managed to create three pilot blends um, for, for Dewar's 15 year old. And what we did was we invited um, key customers from the Chinese and the Taiwanese markets. We brought them to Scotland, took them to Stirling Castle and had a great time. And then 
we presented them with three pilot blends and asked them to choose which one they liked the best. And and that was that was how we did it. We've, we've, never, done, we've never done that before. And we haven't done it since like that, but it certainly it was a very rapid process. And um, so obviously people ask me, you know, what's, what's my favorite blend? That probably is my favorite one because that was my very first blend I did from, from scratch. So it was, it was really exciting. And, you know, it was well received, but it's really taken off in the US. Um, so we put it into some gorgeous packaging. Um, and, you know, it, it looks beautiful and it, it tastes beautiful. It's just so fruity and smooth and, and again, very easy drinking. And that's the 15 right there. One there. Somebody pointed out that I just yeah. seem to always have the right bottle to hand when I reach back here, but uh, part of that is preparation. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought can, maybe you had a mirror there that you could just could see. <laughs> no. A question from Graham Fraser, and this may be a little controversial. Graham has been disappointed over the past 20 years of visiting okay. Aberfeldy that its whiskies are not matured on site and are matured mm -hmm. down in the central belt of Scotland around Glasgow mm -hmm. or so. Are the maturation influences different down there than up around uh, up around the uh, the Pitley Burn and the area in Aberfeldy? Um, the straight question that is, I don't know. Um, so it, it's different warehousing in in Aberfeldy, and we would love to be in state the warehouse. And and we may well we may well do it. Um, I, I personally would certainly love to do it. I mean, it is certainly not big enough um, to house all the spirit that we need um, to to mature um, in order to you know feed all the bottlings that we need to do. But I've often thought it would be a, a lovely retirement home. For for aged malts, um, so so that has <laughs> been my kind of little dream, um, to to reinstate the distillery and just have that you know a, a nice little place for them to, um, enjoy the view, um, and hear the tilly burn trickling on the way back past. I mean, it's obviously it's a different type of warehouse. It's a dunnage warehouse, and so it's the the ash floors. And you know, very low level, very insulated walls. So, I I absolutely hear what you're saying, um, but you know the the different. It really is a task, is is the major factor. Um, you know, the environment in which it's held is important, but you know, perhaps for a, a single cast, you can see the different influences of maybe the top of of the warehouse and the bottom. But when you're taking a whole stow, um, that influence kind of, it, it all comes together. Um, so I, it, it's a very, it's a, a great question. And and I hope one day that, that we will have um, the the warehouse up and running um, again at Adam Fildy. That would be lovely. That sort of leads us into our, our last question from Whiskey Canuck on, uh, speaking of starting trouble here, we saw the uh, study that came out of Ireland this week about uh, Waterford and its terroir study. And terroir is a popular trend in single malts, but is there a way to incorporate it into blends or do you have to just stay away from it? Uh, where do you come down on the whole terroir thing? I'm having some second thoughts about it just after reading some of the Waterford stuff this week. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I firmly believe, I, I don't know if it's a scientist in me, um, but, you know, I really do believe that it's, you know, that the barley is important, the yeast that we use is important, the fermentation time and the cask are, are the really important parts um, you know, the, the environments, the, the soil, 
you know, I'm I'm not I can I get it for grapes. Um but I'm you know hopefully you're not recording this and nobody else is watching it so I wouldn't be you know No nobody's <laughs> watching this. Nobody's watching this anywhere no, that, in the that's world. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I kid. Uh, so I wouldn't contradict myself in years to come. But yeah, I, I think I need to see real hard evidence before I um, start talking about it. <laughs> well, and it wouldn't be contradicting yourself. It would be just being provided with new information. Think of it that way. But exactly. the thought I've yeah. had since reading this is that I'm beginning to think, wait a second. Terroir in whiskey is completely different than in wine because you can have it in wine because it's the same vines producing the same grape varieties year after year. It's the same vines. It's not like you're plowing up the field and planting mm -hmm. new vines every year the same way you yeah. do with barley. And I'm going, wait a second, that adds a whole other variability yeah. into there that we don't even think about. I'm going, wait a second, mm -hmm. I'm, I, yeah. I haven't had a chance. I'm... If I run this by Mark Rainier at Waterford, his head's going to explode, and we'll just fight for the next two hour for two hours about it. <laughs> but um, I'm just thinking that uh, I, I can taste the differences in their single origins. But I also want to say, okay, yeah, that's one year's distillation. Is it the same in that field from year to year to year? Mm -hmm. I think we need more. I think we need more evidence before we can really, uh, really define it. Yeah, I mean, I, I there are people out there who have said to me that they can tell. So there was a, a variety of, of barley called Golden Promise um, that was used probably in the 70s and 80s. And I've heard if people have come up to me and said, you know, I, I, can, I, I could tell when you stopped using Golden Promise when you move on to, you know, chair tour or something like that and I was like really really <laughs> um mm. and you know, people do do believe in that and they they can tell the differences um but I, I, I just would like to see a bit more you know chemical analysis maybe yeah and I lied we do have one more question but it's story, viewers specific yeah um, a Champell, will doers yeah. continue to release the scratched cask blend that seems to reach out to bourbon drinkers and had something like forty different malts? Uh, I liked the scratched cask because it had the uh, if you if for those who aren't familiar with it, it had the gouges in the casks that let the whiskey get a little further into the wood. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it it was a beautiful. I've got a bottle of it here actually. That was a, I don't know if you can see that. So that was a 12 yeah. year old. And what we did, we definitely were celebrating bourbon. And we put the whiskey into um, bourbon casks um, and virgin barrels and rye casks. And we'd never used virgin casks before. And so we got this real blast of colour and blast of astringency as well. Um, so what we had to do was we had to, to blend the virgin spirit very delicately and gingerly into the bourbon and the rye. But my goodness, uh, I just loved that whiskey. And just the name of it and the story behind it was a bit, a bit confusing. But um, I really want to resurrect that because I just, I just loved it. Um, I just came across it the other day, actually, in the lab, and I thought, oh, you little beauty, <laughs> come to mama. <laughs> so I, we, and rye, at the time we were producing that, rye was really hard to get hold of, and it, it still is quite tricky to get hold of rye casks. Um, so it does take a bit of planning, but um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a beautiful whiskey. So yeah, watch this space. We won't be calling it Scratch Cask again, though. We'll call it something else. 
Okay, but let us know if we can help lean on some folks within the marketing team to make that happen, because I liked that one too. Yeah, yeah good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Stephanie, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this has been a blast. Uh, we, I really appreciate your answering all, all these questions from our audience around the world tonight. And I want to thank you for your time. I know it's late over there, but uh, Slanjava, and thank you for all the great whiskeys over the years. Oh, thank you, Mark, for all your support, truly. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I never everybody. did ask, what are you Slange. drinking tonight? What is what's in your glass tonight? I never asked. Portuguese smooth. Oh, okay. Portuguese Just smooth. Sure. Of course. Yeah. I yes. should have told by the color. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you so much. Yeah. We'll uh, talk to you again soon. Once again, I want to oh, thank, thank uh, you. Steph bye bye. Bye bye. I want to thank you, Stephanie, for Stephanie McLeod of Doers for joining us tonight. The uh, master blender for Doers and all of its single malts as well. Don't forget to join us next week. We'll be joined by Kevin O'Gorman, the master distiller for Irish Distillers and Middleton Distillery. Uh, Kevin just got yesterday, as I reach over here to the desk, his uh, first release of Middleton Very Rare that just came out. I will have my tasting notes for it on the show this uh, on the podcast this weekend. We'll also be joined by Stuart McCannon, our longtime pal from... Uh, Brown Foreman's Glen Dronick and Ben Riach Distilleries, and uh, we'll take your whiskey questions again as well. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Um, hit the like buttons, tell your friends about the webcast, and we'll uh, see you on the podcast this week. Thanks for everyone. Take care and stay safe and be good to each other.